We are frequently asked to cover the intriguing ancient documents of ancient Sumeria, and for good reason. For although the Sumerian King List is officially classified as an accurate and important chronographic document from ancient Mesopotamia, the lifespans of many of the oldest of its rulers are stated as having lived for upwards of 30,000 years. Furthermore, there is a noticeable steady decline in the duration of these rulers' lives. This gradual decline, when seen in its complete translated form, if, of course, it is indeed an accurate documentation of history, displays a clear example of devolution over many thousands of years. It lists a long succession of cities in Sumer and the surrounding regions. The first fragment of the text, which is largely believed to date back at least 4,000 years, was found in the early 1900s by Hermann Hilbrecht at the site of ancient Nippur, with its discovery subsequently published in 1906. Since Hilbrecht's discovery, at least 18 other fragments of the list have been found, most of them dating from the second half of the Isin dynasty. Yet this controversial claim of past rulers' ages is a reoccurring theme with many of these fragments, reiterating these incredibly long lifespans. Furthermore, intriguingly, the Epic of Gilgamesh, perhaps the most famous, still surviving contribution to world history dating back to Mesopotamia, is depicted as nothing short of a giant. Often depicted, carrying what is perceived as his pet lion, the cat, however, appears far from tame attempting to take a chunk from his arm, but due to Gilgamesh's relative size to his furry friend, merely appears as nothing more than a kitten when in his embrace. Could these claims of a 20,000-year lifespan be connected to the additional claim of many of the figures from this era's incredible sizes? Could heavy research and a subsequent in-depth expose regarding the reality surrounding the claims of the Mesopotamian civilization finally confirm the past existence of not only giants, but human beings, whom, after their derivation from divinity, initially had lifespans stretching into 30,000 years? For as the list states, and I quote, After the kingship descended from heaven, they were situated within Eridung in Alulim. It is named after Eridung, who became king. He ruled for 28,800 years with Alijar subsequently ruling for 36,000 years after him. Two kings who ruled for 64,800 years." End quote. As one would predict, such claims are simply dismissed by academics the world over. This is, of course, due to the tales of the king's immense longevity, and due to their own paradigms, one they are often funded to regurgitate, would have simply been impossibility. Additionally, Along with this staunch denial, to even consider such possibilities within mainstream study, this same fate befalls the countless, gigantic, unexplained megaliths found the world over. This is a clear example of how valuable academia perceives their illusionary, oracle-esque all-knowing regarding a complete history of human civilization. For if one was to consider such past individuals, having been responsible for the Great Pyramids for example, one could finally explain how, and indeed who, accomplished such ancient feats. But I digress. Could Mesopotamia be the key to unlocking many secrets hidden or lost within human history? We find such possibilities as highly compelling. The Nimrod Castle, which translates as Castle of the Large Cliff, is an astonishing ancient fortress. And although this awe-inspiring site has predictably been dated to the medieval era. We feel that due to the many anomalous megalithic blocks within its construction, it is far older than this and undoubtedly a remnant left by a highly advanced civilization, now unfortunately lost to history. This due to academia's funded and often deliberate ignorance. Many of the oldest blocks present within the structure, for example, are all upwards of 10 tons, with some of the heaviest recognized as being over 40 tons in weight. How modern curators and academics alike can attest to these ruins having been created by our tremendously less capable medieval ancestors, we feel, is preposterous. 
According to those in the so-called No, the fortress was created from scratch during the Ayyubid dynasty, placed within the 12th and 13th centuries. The dynasty undoubtedly existed, this we do not deny. We also do not disagree with the posit that the dynasty ruled large parts of the Middle East during these centuries. However, we suspect that, just like the many other unexplainable ancient advanced ruins found throughout the world, these more recent ruling ancestors, and indeed the large array of ancient artifacts which they left, creating an archaeological legacy, has been used to conveniently date and explain this miraculous structure away, avoiding the controversial truth which is clear for all to see. The fortress is situated on the southern slopes of Mount Hermon, upon a ridge that rises over 2,600 feet above sea level overlooking the Golan Heights. We feel that due to its strategical location, much of the structure was rebuilt upon. This task completed with the purpose of guarding a major access route. We believe that upon the leader of this dynasty, Al-Aziz Uthman, discovering the enormous, impenetrable polygonal masonry still in existence within the walls of the site, that were left by a people who, at some point within antiquity, mysteriously vanished. This leader made the logical decision to build upon the impressive remnants, with these walls being reused, utilized for a more modern fortress. This second phase, predictably made with far smaller blocks, and thus, can be easily explained as medieval architecture. A fortress could have indeed been its original purpose, this due to its strategically placed location. Indeed, other ancient, advanced, seemingly impenetrable fortresses can be found in other places within the world, such as Sacsayhuaman. Although its true grandeur, or its initial advanced builder's intention for the structure, may take tremendous, meticulous, alternative research to eventually unravel. Furthermore, intriguingly, the enigmatic yet highly recognizable shape of this initial stonework is also present at another site, possibly a number of other sites, although in particular within Jerash, a site currently claimed as Roman. Who built the Fortress of Nimrod? How can academia claim that this site was built by the Ayyubid dynasty, while another ruin, unquestionably constructed with the same form of megalithic blocks, seemingly dating for the same era, be that of the Romans? We feel that these two sites, each containing the same building features, yet claimed as completely different civilizations work, both placed within our more recent history, yet in vastly different centuries is clear evidence of academic fallacy, evidence of their explanative contradictions when it comes to the many currently controversial ancient ruins of Earth. Nimrod Fortress is yet another jewel in the crown of a civilization currently lost to history. It is undoubtedly highly compelling. Tucked away in the bowels of the Israel Museum within Jerusalem is a small, inconspicuous artifact that if the claims of its origins, believed by many independent researchers and scholars alike, be true, it would support the existence of a remarkable treasure, which countless individuals over the millennia have become convinced of its existence, yet their efforts to discover this treasure were all to no avail. Yet a small ivory pomegranate, about the size of an adult's thumb, with some rather intriguing inscriptions still readable upon it, could possibly prove those who believe in its existence right all along. The object's Paleo-Hebrew inscription contains the divine name of Yahweh, which was used by the ancient Israelites. If authentic, then this small ivory pomegranate may be a still-existing head of a scepter of King Solomon, which could have only been found within a treasure and possible tomb, which many claim still remains beneath Solomon's temple itself. What makes this treasure so incredibly intriguing, if indeed it existed, along with its gold and silver relics, 
and the aforementioned scepters and canes, was that with this collection has long been claimed to have been the storage place for the Ark of the Covenant, whose location is also continually debated by many different fields of interest. The scepter's head's authenticity has, predictably, been dismissed by some and argued as real by others. Yet having first came to the attention of the public over 30 years ago, its discovery and possible incredible origins have received a suspiciously low level of media attention. Paleographer André Lemaire initially stumbled across the ivory pomegranate in 1979 for sale in an antiquity shop in Jerusalem. Le Maire published a note on the object in the French scholarly journal Revue Biblique in 1981, and by his 1984 issue of BAR, the inscribed ivory pomegranate was really beginning to be looked at seriously. For 15 years, the inscribed ivory pomegranate could be seen at the Israel Museum displayed in a special room with a direct beam of light on it. In 2005, however, a committee comprised of Israel Antiquities Authority and Israel Museum Scholars published a report in the Israel Exploration Journal concluding that the inscription was a forgery. However, this claim by the individuals who forensically examined the object originally were later redacted stating they could not confirm its authenticity, yet were reluctant to state it as authentic. Yet regardless, it is now curiously protected and not on display. Is this object really a surviving relic from the treasures of the Temple of Solomon? Does this support the possibility that other treasures, specifically the Ark of the Covenant, could really exist? We find such possibility highly compelling. On the 25th of January, 2011, the streets of Cairo were being ravaged by a rioting population, demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year regime. While the world was distracted by the dramatic scenes of chaos upon the streets above, deep within the ancient dusty tunnels, a team of archaeologists led by Suzanne Bickel of the University of Basel in Switzerland was quietly making one of the most significant discoveries of the past century. They had initially found the top of a large round stone at the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings. The archaeologists suspected that it was just the top of an abandoned shaft, but before they could investigate, due to Egypt's political process regarding finds within the valley, they had to cover the stone rim with their own locked iron door, inform the Egyptian authorities and apply for an official permit to excavate. A year later, after gaining approval to excavate, Bickel returned with a team of two dozen people, including field director Elena Paula Goth of the University of Basel, Egyptian inspector Ali Rita, and local workmen. Each took turns lying on the ground, head pressed against the shaft wall, one arm through a small hole next to the capstone, snapping photographs. They left little doubt that it was indeed an ancient tomb. On top of the debris rested a dusty black coffin, carved from sycamore wood and decorated with large yellow hieroglyphs on its sides and top. Bickel has stated that she has never seen an Egyptian coffin in such a good condition before. The dating of fragments of pottery made from Nile silt and pieces of plaster, commonly used to seal tomb entrances in ancient times, together with the age of the other nearby sites, have indicated that the tomb could be more than 3,000 years old. The hieroglyphs describe the tomb's occupant as being named Nahimi's Bastet. Egyptologists currently believe she was a lady of the upper class and of Amun. People have been claiming there was nothing new left to find in the Valley of the Kings for almost as long as they have been digging there. The Venetian antiquarian Giovanni Belzoni believed he had emptied the last of the valley's tombs during his 1817 expedition, while Theodore Davis, who excavated there a century later, came to a similar conclusion right before Tutankhamun's burial chamber was found. 
Unfortunately, there is a growing number of people who are beginning to suspect that there is a wealth of discoveries still left to be made in the Valley of the Kings, the Nile Delta, and Egyptian as a whole. And thanks to discoveries such as these, interest in these existing mysteries grows by the day. It is interesting to see that in this period, even a wealthy girl was buried with quite simple things, Bickle says, comparing Nahim's Bastet's coffin and steel with the elaborate pottery, furniture, and food found in earlier tombs. Her wooden coffin was certainly quite expensive, she says, but nonetheless, it lacked the elaborate inner coffins found in similar burials. Is this the burial chamber of an extremely ancient queen? After reinforcing the coffin and securing the mummy, Bickle's team have transported across the Nile to Luxor, where a full investigation is currently being undertaken into the true identity of the mystery female. With substantial insight into the controversial finds within ancient Egypt, we personally suspect that often the tombs, which appear the most crudely designed, containing wooden sarcophagus, are generally found to be the most ancient. Furthermore, their hieroglyphic writings were often far more exquisite in nature. Could this be the discovery of an original burial, and the crude hieroglyphic claim of the occupant's identity of fake? Hiding the Delta's true antiquity? A secret many fringe scientists have begun to believe is being protected by Egyptian antiquities. Many have come to suspect the Egyptians merely copied the original builders of the pyramids after taking occupation of their structures many years later. Supportive evidence for these claims comes in many forms. Erosion upon the pyramids, and especially the Sphinx, including over 100 underground chambers we are currently researching, discovered under Giza in 1995 by a team led by Kent Weeks, which also show strong evidence of several flash flooding events involving seawater throughout their long existence. The lack of any written detail pertaining to the construction of either monument in any hieroglyphs found in ancient Egypt, and so on. We find it incredibly intriguing that more was not made public regarding this amazing find, which leads us to suspect it may be a highly important, albeit highly controversial, discovery. We will continue to do research on Nahem's Bastet and will endeavor to keep you all informed regarding any notable findings.